Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon for insight into this important topic. I am Iris Palmer, Deputy Director at Community Colleges here at New America. Over the last four years, our team has been researching bachelor's degrees offered at community colleges. And since then, we have published a lot of research, but more importantly, there's a growing number of states that have authorized CCB programs, and the number of programs has continued to grow. And with that growth, we've seen an increased interest in the topic, which we found incredibly gratifying. Currently, half of states authorize at least one predominantly, predominantly associate's degree granting college to offer bachelor's degrees. As of this year, 142 community colleges had at least one bachelor's degree program with 565 CCB programs nationwide. Early on in our research into CCB programs, we started to hear different reasons for creating these programs in different parts of the country. This makes sense because community college baccalaureate degree programs are usually applied in nature and they're closely connected to the local economic needs. And those economic needs are really different in urban communities and in rural communities. We heard stories about how in rural areas, CCB programs created access to education at the bachelor's degree level for people with connections to the community and allowed those people to become business leaders or teachers or healthcare providers and without leaving home. And we heard about how in urban areas, CCBs created an affordable pathway into fast growing, well-paying jobs with so much employer demand that more programs were desperately needed. Since we've always thought about CCBs as an equity and access strategy, we wanted to further investigate the role that these programs play in these different community contexts. We know that community colleges are centered on the needs of their communities. And given the differences in communities across the country, it's hardly surprising that the reasons they give for creating CCB programs and the program types of programs they choose are very different. This new research puts those differences and some of the similarities into stark contrast. For instance, there are more than twice as many rural CCB programs in engineering, technology, and nursing. And in urban community colleges, they offer three times as many IT programs. The discussion with the practitioners this afternoon will continue to illuminate the differences and similarities of how CCB degrees fit into community colleges missions. And I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing more and getting deeper into that context. But first, I wanna thank the Joyce Foundation and Ascendium Education Group for supporting this work. And I'm also thrilled to introduce Sue Chui, Senior Program Officer at Ascendium, she co-leads strategic grant making in support of Ascendium's removing structural barriers to success focus area, which seeks to transform colleges and universities to foster seamless academic pathways for learners from low income backgrounds. Sue, we're excited to hear more. Take it away. Thank you, Iris. We're proud in, uh, to support this body of work at the Center on Education and Labor at New America. Education, uh, Ascendium Education Group is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Madison, Wisconsin, where the nation's largest federal student loan guarantor and a provider of student loan services. In our capacity as a post-secondary education and workforce training philanthropy, we partner with organizations like New America to reach our goal of helping more students from low-income backgrounds, especially first-generation students, rural community members, veterans, students of color, and incarcerated adults, to reap the benefits of post-secondary access and increased social mobility. And because community colleges enroll over half of Pell Grant recipients nationwide and serve as important starting points for a significant proportion of older and racially minoritized learners, they are critical actors and audiences in our work. Ascendium has partnered with New America since late 2020 to better understand the role that community college baccalaureates play in meeting employer demand for degrees, as well as demand for affordable bachelor's degrees for low-income and rural communities. We're interested in elevating practices and policies that enable community colleges to develop or adapt degree programs well and quickly particularly in response to a changing workforce and economy. With an increasing number of states allowing CCB, 
it's important that we pursue high quality evidence and equitable outcomes in the implementation of this curricular innovation. I look forward to learning more from New America and its network of institutional partners, like those you'll hear from shortly, for advancing the field's understanding of CCB as a lever for access and success. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ivy Love, and I'm a senior policy analyst in the Center on Education and Labor at New America. Um, really grateful to have you all here with us this afternoon. I hope if you're somewhere where it's cooling off a little bit, you've got your afternoon tea or coffee with you while we have this conversation about community college bachelor's degrees and how these programs live and breathe in rural communities and in urban communities. Um, so I'll invite any of you who are listening to share your questions while we're talking um, with the panel this afternoon. Use the chat function and let us know what you're curious about or would like to learn more about. So uh, looking around the room from my angle, we have Lael Noonan from Central Wyoming College, um, Helen Breed from Trinity Valley Community College in Texas, and Connie Renda from San Diego Mesa College. Um, I so appreciate you all three being here, and I'm glad we get to talk about this. We had our own little preparatory call for the webinar last week, but now you all get to enjoy a conversation with us as well. Um, so what I would love to do is start off with a sort of broad question, um, just briefly to each one of you. Um, so if I could start with a few things. So what is the bachelor's program that you're involved in, um, bachelor or bachelor's programs that you're involved in? Um, what's your role as pertains to the bachelor's degree program? And can you tell us a little bit about your college and your community? Um, could I start with Dr. Noonan, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I am at Central Wyoming College in Riverton, Wyoming, and um, we have two bachelors of applied science degrees. One of them is in early childhood education with a special ed emphasis, and the other one is a bachelor's of organizational management and leadership with several emphasis areas, um, tribal leadership, business entrepreneurship, outdoor leadership, and um, we have law enforcement uh, emphasis that's about ready to launch and several others in the works. Um, I'm the director of both degrees and I also teach all the leadership classes in the in the organizational leadership and or management and, and leadership option or degree, excuse me. Thanks so much. Yes, you're wearing a lot of hats. That was something I took away from early conversations. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Reed, would you like to introduce yourself, Trinity Valley, and um, what's happening in Terrell? Sure. Uh, so I'm uh, Helen Reed from Trinity Valley Community College. It's a, a community college in East Texas, just about east of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a little bit southeast, uh, serving about five counties. So we're we're some of us are very rural, and then some are suburban, since we do serve the kind of East uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. And so, I'm representing the baccalaureate um, degree is the the RNWSN, uh, the nursing degree, and we just finished our first year with that last year. Had our first graduating class in May, and I was the provost of the health occupations uh, division, the health science center. And for uh, just retired my full time position after 39 years, but I'm still going to teach in the RN to BSN program. Thank you so much. And congratulations on your retirement. This is very Thank recent. You. Like, oh, yeah, just this summer. Um, Professor Renda, could you would you be willing to go next? Sure. Thanks. So I'm Connie Renda. I am the uh, program director and then full time contract faculty for San Diego Mesa College. We're in San Diego. We're one of four colleges in our district called San Diego Community College District and a very urban setting uh, in the middle of a very large metropolitan area with a lot of health care, which is why we have a health information management bachelor's degree. We were the first in the state to launch a bachelor's degree in 2015. Uh, when uh, we had a pilot uh, allowance, the, the legislation allowed for pilot degrees, and we were, we were the first to obtain that in San Diego. So uh, thank you for sharing a little bit more. Um, so you all have gotten started on these bachelor's programs within the last 10 years. I think um, the one at San Diego Mesa College is the oldest of the three institutions here that are represented um, with Wyoming only passing their authorizing le legislation in 2019. So this is very new to Wyoming. 
Um, and then for Texas, they started with a pilot about 20 years ago in a few colleges, but really it was just 2017 when it got opened up a lot more to other institutions. So my next question that I want to pose to all of you is what had to change or adapt at the college when you introduced a bachelor's program? That could be in terms of faculty accreditation process, whatever's coming up for you about what that process was like to start this new level of a program. Um, let's go backwards around the order. Um, Professor Renda, could I kick that to you first? Sure. So like I said, for us, uh, we had a, a pilot program. So we had to very much explain why we needed this bachelor's degree in our community specifically. And that was probably the biggest, I, I think for anyone starting a bachelor's degree program, the first thing you should do is find another program either in the same profession or similar to, um, to tie into the work that they've done. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. None of us are competing against each other in any way. Um, I'm personally more than happy to, and I would expect my colleagues here to feel the same, but personally more than happy to um, share my email and have any, any of the work I've done, I'm happy to, to send out. Uh, there's no reason for anybody to do that again. Um, and then, so just in general, what we had to do because we were, very groundbreaking. Uh, there were no other bachelor's degree programs in the state of California uh, in public institutions for my field. And then, of course, nobody else had done a bachelor's degree program. So it was very much um, understanding what we needed to do. Again, buying in from industry, that was our primary goal. And that's what we relied on constantly to have them support the legislation. Um, to have them support our curriculum. And then of course we had to develop the curriculum uh, to, according to the, our external accreditation standards, as well as the ACCJC, who still governs our colleges, even though we're offering higher level degrees. And then our Western Association of Colleges, Schools and Colleges, WASC accreditation. So there were multiple things that we had to consider, uh, but all of them, in the end, of course, work together, but it was very much uh, making sure that we checked all the boxes for all of the different requirements. Um, so I would say that would be the primary thing. Yeah, it's a lot of ducks to get in a row um, to, to get something off the ground. And thinking about the accreditation piece of this, that's making me think of Trinity Valley, because we talked about sort of what that looks like. Um, Dr. Reed, could you share a little bit more about either that process and, and anything else at Trinity Valley that um, sort of got sure. adapted to bring this program online. Sure. Well, we were very interested in um, academic progression. I've been working in, uh, in with APEN and the um, or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We had a grant way back in 2011. So I was really interested in that. Uh, so it was really great. And going from associate nursing to bachelor's nursing and like right. clearing that yes. pathway. Yeah. Right. And so that's the industry was trying to focus on getting 80% of RNs to, to get their bachelor's degree by 2020. So that was, um, there was a real impetus in our college to, to do that. Uh, our president was all in. He wanted us to do that. Our first obstacle, though, was space. We had no space. So we did have to wait until um, we moved. So we uh, renovated an old hospital in Carroll and moved there. So once we had space, we were able to get started on that process. Of course, you have to do the first, the, all the internal processes first, going through your curriculum instruction and getting the board of trustees to approve everything. And then of course we had to do the board of nursing and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And the board of nursing kind of really focused more on curriculum. Uh, that, you know, perspectives you have to send to them. I think that was about 500 pages. So definitely very involved. And then the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board needed to make sure that uh, we had the, the, the physical and, and financial resources in order to be able to uh, start this and that there was a need. And, you know, we, uh, East Texas region was one of the lowest regions in terms of the percentage of baccalaureate nurses. Um, so that was, that really helped us uh, for that. And then, so once you get those approvals, then you work on the regional accreditation. So the Southern, we, because Trinity Valley, this was the first uh, bachelor's degree at Trinity Valley, we needed to change from being a level one degree granting institution to a level two. So that involves a whole prospectus to get to, uh, for us, it's the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, uh, SAC, COC. And so we started that process um, 
And then uh, they had to come for a site visit. So we had our site visit in February of 21. Uh, so I take that back, February of 22. Um, they came after, they had to approve it. Sorry, Sachs had to approve it first. So they finally approved in Jul, uh, right beginning of July of 21. Then we wanted to start, of course, in the fall of 21. We then had to do the application to the Department of Education so we could get um, financial aid. So that was kind of a really tight uh, time frame there. So our first class only had about 23 students that we admitted. We wanted to go to 30. Uh, we were able to then the next year get to 30 because we had uh, we knew we had financial aid. Um, and so then after we get the SACs, they came for their site visit when we had the program going, that went well. And then we got going on our uh, ASIN, which is our nursing accreditation. So we became a, a candidate for, uh, for accreditation. And then uh, in the next few, uh, couple of years, we're going to do it by, I think, fall of 23. We have to have a site visit for that. And because we became a candidate before our first graduating class, once we get uh, accreditation, hopefully we will, then it will be retroactive and then the, the first graduating students will get their accreditation. So it's a definitely a step-by-step -step process, um, kind of lengthy. So I think that we started probably in the um, January, February of 2020 and then had our first uh, class in, uh, in August of 21. So about a year and a half. Yeah, um, congratulations, first of all, on your first graduates. That's really wonderful to have. And I think going through all of those steps so quickly, which, you know, you're a school of health sciences during a global pandemic. It's not like you were busy with other things during that right. time, right? Um, <laughs> yes. So managing to pull that off during that time, I think speaks to a really strong commitment to the program. And, you know, just something else that came up while we were initially talking earlier okay. this year was faculty, because you're oh, that's true. Right. About faculty. So can you tell folks a little bit about that? Yes, because I think that was one of the main uh, obstacles for uh, Texas to approve getting the bachelors of nursing uh, at community colleges because the universities were afraid that we would steal their faculty because uh, you, you do have to have 25 percent of the faculty to have, you know, the terminal degree. So I think in 2017, when it was approved, we did have several faculty uh, that started their doctor of nursing practice uh, pathway. And I think since that time we have had, I think I counted six faculty that have um, gotten their DNP. So uh, we were able to take everything, care of everything in-house, didn't have to go outside and poach from anybody. So I think that's good. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. And congratulations to all of your faculty doing a DNP yes. while you're working is, is no joke. So they worked very hard. Yes. <laughs> that's great. That's great to hear. And to hear that, you know, while nurses in the community are getting up to the bachelor level, your faculty are also growing in their own professional development. I think that's, that's really yes. wonderful. Um, and Dr. Noonan, we had some conversations about the many things at Central Wyoming, both like tangible and sort of cultural that you feel like changed in the institution. So I would just love to you to give me broad base. What changed when the law passed in Wyoming in 2019 and you, you all got to work very quickly? What sort of shifts happened? It happened very quickly. Um, our, our VP of Academic Affairs was astounding. We wrote curriculum in six weeks and um, it was amazing. Um, how that was maneuvered. But the big thing was the buy-in that was important for us. We are very rural. So what was important for us was that we had buy-in from everybody on the campus, every area, and also from the community. So there's a lot of legwork that went about just communicating and networking with the community and getting everybody's input. Do you want this? Is this something that, I mean, we knew it was a demand, it was a need. Um, because our university is so far away. It's on the other side of the state. So this has been huge. Uh, we expected 10 or 15 people um, to come in that first semester and they were uh, in the 40s. Um, and during a pandemic, it, the numbers increased, even though that was you know, a challenge for everybody. Um, and so the need is definitely there. Uh, we are on the Wind River, right next to the Wind River Indian Reservation. Um, and have a lot of different um, communities that we serve um, where they can't go get extended education. So this, I think, has changed the dynamic of our community in the sense that there are options if you want them. And there have, that has not existed before I grew up here, I was raised here. 
um, and went elsewhere to get my education. And and this this opportunity is is very huge for everyone. But um, our faculty, we we kept everything in house. Um, our college is kind of unique to some colleges in the sense that we have far more full time faculty than we do adjuncts. So. Um, we had people who were qualified and able, and we made adjustments. Um, so um, I happen to have a doctorate in the field that, uh, in the area of the degree. So that was kind of a very helpful getting getting that moved through, especially those upper level classes. And um, so that just worked out very well. But I would say that we are accountable to our community. And so if, if it's if there are things the community wants, then that's our obligation to make sure to fulfill that. So um, that's kind of our emphasis for for how we function in general for this college. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think the bringing up options and like creating options for folks and honoring their roots in the community while they're doing that is something that came out in conversations both with the rural schools that I talked to. Um, rural slash suburban folks like Trinity Valley and highly urbanized areas like San Diego as well. So um, I would love to hear your takes, Dr. Reed and, and Professor Renda, on how this creates a different option for folks. Like what need in the community is a bachelor's degree meeting? We talked about what these programs are, what changed at the institution, but what, what benefit are students accruing for this that they wouldn't have had without this bachelor's program at your institution? Um, uh, Dr. Reed, do you wanna, can I ask you that first and then I'll go to Professor Renda. So that's, that's uh, an important thing for us that we have to, to uh, market what the value added is because uh, our ADN graduates are already RN. So um, there's often not a, any difference in pay uh, or the you know are the jobs that type so we have to say why you know why is it so important to um, that they should go on uh, so uh, especially when we got started a lot of um, there was not a shortage in nursing at that time and so a lot of the employers were saying okay you need to get your your bachelor's degree within a certain amount of years so that's one reason why they're going on so they could keep a job uh, or they want to go on and get a um, master's or higher degree, want to become nurse practitioners, that type of thing. So the bachelor's is the next step. Uh, but it, it's very important that we that we do market and and focus on what the value added is. Mm -hmm. And, and so, means, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, you know, we really focus on things that they haven't learned so much in the um in the associate degree program. So we're focusing on research, we're focusing on uh, taking care of populations and groups rather than just patients and their families. And we're focusing on leadership. So we have to really pay attention to that. So, and it's important that there's nothing that they know that there's nothing wrong with the care that they give to their patients as associate degree nurses. I would much, I'd want an associate degree nurse taking care of me in the hospital, but the baccalaureate degree uh, graduate is now looking at the bigger picture. And they're not only concerned about their patient, they're looking at for future patients and how can I improve the processes where I'm working to make things better for future patients. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And I think like having that available at a familiar institution with a low cost is huge. That's um, the, that's the, yeah, because that's our mission is to provide affordable and accessible uh, um, education. And we have, we cannot, because of the state rules, we cannot um, have any higher tuition for these graduates. So it's definitely cheaper than all the universities in the state. Uh, but I think that the, 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 relationship that they have with their faculties in the ADN program is one of the major things because I think our first class, all but one of the students were our graduates. So they just want to continue with what's familiar. They're, some, I think, intimidated by the universities and some do not, you know, they don't want to travel outside of their community. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And Professor Rinda, what, if, what about at San Diego Mesa? Like what, what need is this meeting in the community and what benefit is it bringing to folks who have roots in San Diego? Yeah, so I think similar to Dr. Reed's uh, story is the people who are working in the field already, because those are a lot of our graduates seem they have the associate's degree, they're already working in the field, they're making decent salaries. 
what they don't realize is that next level of that higher level rigor that you get from a bachelor's degree is going to be needed at some point. If they're going to continue in the career and they're going to continue, um, and even the work that Dr. Noonan's doing, at some point you can work in a job at, at a certain level um, and then you're going to need that next level of education to, to move on, whether it's nursing management or organizational leadership management, some kind of, um, and even if you don't go into management, just being able to manage yourself as an employee of a large organization or even a small organization. So it's, it's really critical. I think for us specifically, it was um, the, the very drastic uh, difference between a paper medical record and an electronic medical record. And the associate's degree just wasn't enough information to get them to that level um, with the ele electronic record. And the field for us is also giant. Uh, there's, they can work as health information management professionals, they can work in insurance companies doing data analytics on you know, their populations and how they get sicker or how they get better. They can work at Medicare, they can work at county epidemiology offices, looking at public health measures and crunching those numbers. So there's lots of different areas they can go into with this higher level degree, and they're more limited with the associate's degree. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, so my next question is that in most states where community college bachelor's degrees are allowed, schools are required either in a proposal or in some form or fashion to present um, evidence of labor market need. There's some labor market need for this. Um, so how you're in three very different economies um, where your colleges are located, your communities are of different sizes or proximity to large metro areas. So what does labor market need for a bachelor's degree look like where you are? Um, Dr. Noonan, could I ask you to answer that first? What's, tell us about Riverton. Um, well, Riverton is um, kind of, in the, as I said, the center of Wyoming. So um, my whole life, it's been a boomer bust kind of town because of the oil rigs. Um, and so the ability to offer other options for individuals who are maybe not able to work almost, um, depending on the demand, um, is huge. The, the need for other skills um, or extended skills, those kinds of things, and the ability to be competitive. Um, and I always tell my students that it's not, it's about when you're in a stack of applications, how close to the top are you? And a lot of times it's going to be your level of education um, yes, experience is absolutely valuable, very, very important, but also that educational piece because it says so much about you before you're ever met by the potential employer. Um, and I, I really feel that, um, you know, my investment in this community is very personal and I have generations of family so, um, who, who have been here. So um, I love the idea that we give diversity to the skill sets that we are we are allowing other things to come in, developing other opportunities and ideas, and not sort of staying. I guess the, the educational piece to me is introducing another mindset, an ex, a, a different mindset in every area. And we have lots of these degrees coming in through our community colleges now in Wyoming. So all of these different locations have this opportunity to now to introduce a different mindset. That doesn't mean what's existing is bad. It's that people who want to diversify or change things up or want a different kind of dream maybe have that opportunity. So um, that's sort of a, a philosophical answer to your question, but um, I feel that it's the most valuable um, in terms of the human beings who live here for sharing that. Yeah, Professor Renda, did you want to jump and, in? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting hearing Dr. Noonan talk about that. One thing she said that's important for us is that we're community colleges. And that's a very different, we're coming from a very different perspective than a university that is having people from all over the world come in and they're very, not that we don't have global awareness, but we're very focused on the fact that we want our community to be better and stronger. And that's a strong uh, asset that the community college baccalaureates degree has have that the other universities that, that non-community college baccalaureates don't have. Um, and the other thing she mentioned was, yes, we're training them on skills, but the, we're really training them on becoming a more educated person 
So there's soft skills, professional skills, 21st century skills changes, you know, the name of that changes every week. Um, but that's what I did my sabbatical research on was we're not just teaching these people how to be good at that job. We're giving them a bachelor's degree that's a well-rounded, there's general education, uh, upper division general education in my program, not just teaching them how to be a health information professional, teaching them management skills. Probably a lot of the courses are very similar to what Dr. Noonan's program has and even Dr. Reed's because they're, the skills that you need at that level are not just the skills of the job. A bachelor's degree is a bachelor's degree. My first bachelor's degree is in psychology. I'm doing nothing with it, so to speak, but yet I have that education to fall back on that technically all of that is, is part of your experience in life and part of being just a better part of our community and of our society. And that's, so we're really teaching again, back to the philosophical, <laughs> uh, but we are really teaching a whole person. Yeah, that's great. I love a philosophical turn in the conversation. I think that's that's very welcome. Um, so as I mentioned before we kicked off the webinar, we do have lots of folks here from other community colleges across the country who either they might not have a bachelor's program and haven't done this before, or they want to try a new one um, or branch out in some way. So you've all been through this process. Do you have any advice for your peers at other institutions who are thinking about taking the leap and starting a bachelor's program? And I'll let I'll I'll let you all um I'll just open it up and let you jump in. Well I would say that it's very, very important to have everybody throw their hat in the ring. Everybody who's going to be affected. I mean we looked at do we have enough housing? Um can student affairs handle more students over a long period of time? What does this look like? Um and how much does it disrupt the flow of our community college? Because we are a community college a two-year institution. Yes, we are adding in bachelor's degrees, but we are not a university. So what does that impact look like? Um, and is everybody on board with it? Is everybody okay with it? Um, and that is that is the most important thing in my mind is getting everybody involved because when they are, it moves very quickly. And everybody kind of says, what can I do? How can I help? Let's build this. And um, the, in my opinion, that's that's the most important thing um, for the institution, certainly. I would, I would say find a mentor over the mountain, somebody who's been there before and uh, talk, uh, find, you know, don't ask them just to give you everything, but as you, as you go through the process and what you don't understand, just you know, ask those specific questions. sharing. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Oh, yeah. uh, and I would also recommend there's an organization called the CCBA. It's the Community College Baccalaureate Association. They have a convention every year and then just tons of resources. Um, and that's where you can find a lot of us who have either been through it or are planning to do it. Uh, it's a great networking organization as well. Yes, and I believe their conference is over by Connie this coming year. So if you want to see Connie, in, it is. In you can come see me on the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think find, finding folks who understand or who have connected and have done this before is important. And I think it, it, that's sort of like the external community as well as like the internal to the college community that you were talking about, Dr. Noonan. It's the connection is necessary, kind of both directions to to build something. Um, I wanted to pose another question here and I'll, I'll let you all um, sort of jump in as, as you'd like to, but um, you've been doing this for a couple of years now. And I wondered if there's a student that comes to mind who you know, has their story has stuck with you or you know that being able to have this bachelor's program available at your local community college really made a big difference for them. Um, so I wondered if you could kind of take, like we'll move from the institutional perspective to what this has meant for you and your interaction with students, what this has meant for them. Well, I don't, since we have just had our first graduating class, I really don't have any yeah. student stories yet, but I do have a student story from uh, another college that I like to share with the students. So it was a school nurse. So as a, you know, as an associate degree prepared school nurse, she's taking care of her patients you know, doing wonderfully. But then when she gets through with her RN to BSN program, uh, she realizes that 
a lot of her her patients, the student, the the children have asthma, and so she does some uh, does some research and she um, creates something so that they have a flag outside and it's uh, it's raised whatever white or something or other when it's bad the bad um, air days, so that she does a lot of education then not only for her her children but for the children's families and then she um, noticed that the school buses were idling and that was creating a uh, bad air so she had to get the stakeholders together and in the school district they got the policy change so they would not they would turn the buses off and uh, wouldn't have them idling for so long. And then she went even further and got a grant. So the whole school district got electric school buses. So she, I mean, she looked at the, she went from taking care of her patients to the, the community type thing. And uh, so hopefully we'll have some students of our graduates will have something similar to that soon. That's really wonderful. And that's that global thinking that you have all three talked right. about. Right, yes, that's that's the thinking. systems thinking that they've got to look at the system and create that, make that better. Yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing that story. Are there student connections coming to mind? Uh, so my favorite student story is uh, the, the student, because we have the associates program. He fell into my program. I'm not really sure how he came in. Um, but our, our profession, by the way, is pri primarily dominated by women. It's about 75, 25 women, probably not for many reasons, but that's how it is. And so we've always been trying to recruit men from an early, early stage to say this is a great profession and even out the playing field and also to get men educated in, in higher education, especially men of color. So this one particular man, African-American young man said, you know, I just sort of fell into this. I really like to play video games. I don't know why I'm here. I'll just kind of see how this goes and um, sort of sat in the back of the classroom, hoodie on, um, long hair and sort of was half engaged. And then I noticed the hoodie came off. He started engaging a little bit more, asking some questions, very introverted. So um, the questions were slow to come and finished his associate's degree. And, and in his last semester, they do a, a internship and he was hired at his internship, a very large hospital system here in San Diego. And it was a per diem job. It was like $19 an hour. He thought, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. This is great, but it's per diem. Well, today he, so then he was part of our first bachelor's degree uh, cohort, uh, stayed on uh, with encouragement from the organization, which is another <clears throat> thing I would recommend is to get your local partners, places that your employees will work on board with your program, whether it's internships, guest speakers, anything you can engage them in, asking them for advice on curriculum, um, it, of course, it, engaging them in an advisory board. They were so engaged in him and in our program that as a team and as a community and as a village, so to speak, we um, put our arms around him and he continued to grow at that organization, finish the bachelor's degree program while he was working. It's another thing that we make sure that they, because we know they have the associates and they're working, our classes are at night so that they can we can accommodate working professionals and not be an economic impact to them. And then uh, he was very successful and just got promoted to supervisor of the department, um, probably making at least as much, if not more than myself, which I'm happy about in a bittersweet kind of a way, you know, um, thrilled about. And he's just a, such a role model for us. We, of course, call him like the poster child because we've used him in a lot of our marketing materials. Um, but that's just a story of somebody who never, ever thought he would get a bachelor's degree. His parents came. Um, one, his mom is a janitor, his mom, his dad is a janitor, excuse me, his mom is, um, I don't remember, but neither one of them had an education and said, I never thought I would see our son having a bachelor's degree. And it, it's just touching. I mean, it affects everybody. It affects his whole family. It affects the, the his next generation. Um, so it's, those are, and that's one of 40 stories I could tell you out of the hundred graduates um, that are, are just absolutely changing their lives. Thanks. Um, congratulations to him for rocketing up the ladder that quickly. And I think having a local program that can like have that close connection where you do you, I mean, you know him, like, you know, your students and you have time to get to know them um, and to work pro to provide an environment that is um, as inclusive as possible. Um, I know you mentioned to me when we were talking 
earlier in the year that providing pathways for students of color was a high priority for San Diego Mesa and creating this program. I know um, across a variety of health professions, black folks and brown folks are underrepresented. And so creating those pathways was really important to you. And um, yeah, I'm excited to hear that folks like that extremely talented young man um, enjoyed their time and uh, you know had a successful time in the program and, and afterwards. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, let's. What, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to talk while I'm doing this. I am going to look at our question sheet and see if we are getting anything from the audience. Yes, we are. Um, what I will say first before I start reading questions is that um, we released a brief today, New America did, um, that covers four college profiles, three of which you've heard about today, um, and includes Austin Community College and their software development program, um, so, which is very interesting um, to learn about, as well as some graphs and charts, just looking at a group of 25 rural, mostly rural institutions, 25 urban institutions that offer, uh, community colleges that offer at least one bachelor's program, sort of what areas of study are most common, how many programs per institution are most common, just to give a sort of global look at what that's like. Um, creating a group of institutions that are rural or urban is a little bit of an oversimplification, um, but I wanted to explore that with you and, and just share what we're learning about how these programs operate in different contexts. Um, so I will give a plug for that. And I see a couple of questions. Um, let me choose one for us. Um, is there a, here, I can answer this one. Is there a current comprehensive list of community colleges that offer bachelor's degrees? Um, I am going to kick you over to the Community College Baccalaureate Association. Um, they have the results uh, from a 2021 study that that I did along with Deborah Bragg, who's affiliated with the Community College Baccalaureate Association and worked closely with us, um, and Tim Harmon, who uh, also worked closely with us on that project. That's been updated and now lives on CCBA's website. So um, if you tweet, I will tweet that link later to show you. But um, if, you, if you are not a tweeter, I do not blame you. And you can find their website at accbd.org. Um, so it's not CCBA and that website's accbd.org. You can look that up and see the inventory of programs. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a question for Professor Renda. Did, what did your work with industry during program development look like? So how did industry input lead into curriculum changes? And I think actually multiple of you might have thoughts about that, what your relationships <laughs> with employers were when you were developing the program. But Professor Renda, we want to kick us off. Yeah, since we were the first uh, to have this, it was integral to our to get to the employee employers, excuse me. And I met with like the CMIO of our largest hospital across the street from our college, and I said, if you had the perfect employee sitting in this chair, what would it look like? What do you need? What exactly are you looking for? What skills do your current employees not have that you would like to send them back to school to obtain? Um, after hours and you know this this was the other piece they dictated a little bit about having a night class we we never had any classes at night and that made sense for both the employers and the employees uh, people who are already working in the field uh, we also to while I was writing curriculum of course I don't know every single thing about the entire industry but yet I was the one kind of like Dr. Newen and who had to write all the curriculum in a very short time. And some of the classes, I thought, I don't know, I, like I know the concept of this, but I don't know what they're going to be doing in a hospital while they're doing this function. So I would ask them to sit in their offices with the people who were doing those jobs and just shadow them and see what skills they needed. And then interviewed and spoke with the employees and just said, what do you need? What other skills should I teach them? Of course, I'm using textbooks as a primary outline guide, but for the most part, I was relying on them and still do to be guest speakers and to be experts in the field. Um, and I think for career tech, especially, it's not just theoretical knowledge. So I have to stay as part of being in the field as well, stay consulting and doing other work in my spare time and in the summers when I'm off so that I can bring that back to the classroom. Because it's not helpful to the students if I just read a textbook about it that's five years old. Uh, so either I need to know about it or I need to bring in guest speakers that are experts in it so that they're learning the best knowledge right away and then telling the students what skills they need. And 
uh, both soft skills and hard skills to be successful to get uh, jobs in the field. Thank you so sure. much. Yeah. Um, uh, for, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. oh, for us um, with nursing, it's important that we use our standards and um, essential. So the uh, Texas Board of Nursing has put out the differentiated essential competencies for nurses, uh, for graduates of a vocational associate and baccalaureate degree. So we had to really rely on those. And then the American Association of Colleges and Nursing put out the baccalaureate essentials. So again, we relied on those. Uh, of course, we did use our advisor committee as well, but the I think it's the standards and guidelines in the industry are very important to use as well. And who, who makes up your advisory committee? Do you have sort of like a range of different healthcare settings or who do you turn to for your advisory uh, committee? The ones that we use are clinical sites. Uh, so the, the, um, the hospitals, the long-term care centers, you know, in, anywhere where we, we go uh, to, to clinical, we, we include them in our advisory committee. That makes good sense. Um, Dr. Noonan, what, what was developing curriculum like I'm thinking, especially for the organizational management and leadership program, what did that look like to build? Well, we actually um, focused on what we had already. Um, we There was already a lot for the tribal leadership portion. Um, and so that was adapted. Uh, there was already a lot in play for the business area. So there was a, you know, an increase in the rigor and, and looking at what fit where um, in terms of the degree, but we didn't try to go reinvent the wheel because we knew we had a very short period of time to turn it around. So the 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 main points were to make sure we had most of the curriculum um, in the associate's degrees that we could modify and adjust, and that we had the faculty who are already qualified to teach so that we didn't have to bring in adjuncts. I mean, I as far as our core, and I love having adjuncts. I have nothing against that, them. They're wonderful. Um, we need adjuncts, but um, I like having the, the faculty teach the core of the degree, and um, that is really important, certainly those upper levels. So um, that's one of the things that we really focused on and made sure, and, and that's why it, was, it, was, it wasn't like we had to start from scratch. I don't know if we could have done that in six weeks, but um, we did do you know the majority of it in that period of time and just modified. Yeah, so what were, and then beyond the curriculum development, what was your interaction like and what is your interaction like with um, businesses or employers or chamber of commerce or who are you engaging with in like an advisory capacity and what does that look like? We had an advisory committee, um, a large group that we brought in the community. I wasn't as involved in that. Our vice president was more involved on in that portion of it, um, but we had surveys that went out. We had a big, huge meeting where the community could attend um, and be involved and, and ask questions. It was really about what do you have? What are your concerns? What are your questions? So businesses all over town. We also found out, were, are you interested? Are you interested in this degree? And do you have employees? Would you send your employees to get this degree? Um, that was very, very important to us to find out. And um, and what areas are you interested in? And if this, the, what we have available isn't what you're looking for, what are you looking for? So um, there was a lot of that just data finding, you know, originally, but um, we do have advisory committees because we have a large CTE program. So the technical studies and all of that, we have a lot of advisory committees. So those happen all the time anyway. So just adding that those groups together and then extending to the community um, at large, uh, was a lot of what occurred when we did this. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So we we got another question that I want to adapt a little bit and pose to you all. Um, so if we had to pick for the future, should we lean more towards in-person hybrid or remote learning for CCB students? So let me take a step back from that because the should is the hard part of that to answer, I think. Could you talk briefly about how you deliver your program? Is there an online option? Is it flex, hybrid? Um, and that may have shifted over the course of the pandemic, but could you just paint us a picture of how folks access the programs? Um, I'll start with that. Yeah, go That's, for it. <laughs> um, we, our recruitment brought in a lot of data about, oh, halfway through the first year and said, we have got to start offering online. There's a demand. So we have three modalities. Um, we do in-person, we do online, and we do Zoom as well, or remote. 
um, we offer offer all of those, not always in the same semester, but our goal is to be able to finish the degree completely 100% online. Um, probably um, not quite half of our students are online learners. So um, because we have a lot of non-traditional students, so they can't meet at designated times. So that works out very well for them. So we are committed to offering, now our outdoor leadership program obviously cannot do the online learning situation. That would be interesting, but um, most of our emphasis areas for these, these degrees and certainly our education degree can be done 100% online and then the student teaching piece. Yeah, so for the early ed program, most things are online and then for tribal leadership and this entrepreneurship. And then the so the the outdoor leadership that you're talking about is sort of like for the outdoor tourism economy across like central Wyoming, just yeah. Yes, there's yeah. a lot of different facets to that options, abilities to, to modify that particular emphasis. And we actually have an area in Lander, Wyoming where they can go and stay and they function out of that. Um, there's cabins and, and they live up there. So that piece is a little bit more in person, a lot more in person. Um, the tribal leadership component um, is, is adjusting to do, being 100% online. It is not at this time, but it's working that direction to offer that for those individuals who might be on other reservations who want to take our program. So, um, but the business entrepreneurship piece is 100% online and the law enforcement, or can be 100% online, and the law enforcement option will, or emphasis area will also be able to be done 100% online as well. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, how's, it, how's this going at Trinity Valley? Uh, so in the rules that came out when um, it, we were first approved by the state said we could not be all online because the universities have plenty of space. So, so they, uh, limited us to hybrid. So we did start with a hybrid program. Basically, this we do eight week sessions and the students come at the beginning of the eight weeks and the end of the eight weeks. So they and uh, the middle one we do then the end of the first eight weeks and the begin the orientation for the second eight weeks. So basically they come three times a semester and that seems to work well. But I have heard that some other uh, colleges in Texas have gone to all online community uh, community colleges, so maybe that rule was relaxed, maybe because of the pandemic, I'm not sure. Uh, so I can see us going, you know, because with nurse, working nurses, some are working days, some working nights, on all, you know, all throughout the week. So trying to find a time when they could all come would be very difficult if it was um, if it was if they had to come weekly. Yeah. I can see it's probably going to more online uh, in the future. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I have another question about like a piece of the BSN program where, you know, they're already registered nurses, so they don't do clinicals like you would in like a technical part of an associate degree, but they still have these practical experiences where they have yes. to do a public health project or leadership. Are there, can you do that online or is there usually an in-person component to that? I'm sure it varies by student. Yeah, that would be in-person, but they could do it mm -hmm. in their own communities. They can do it on their own time. So, mm -hmm. and, and then with the leadership, they work with a leader mentor. So again, they can schedule that on their own. Okay, okay, that's yes. great. Yeah, thanks. How, how, what about San Diego, Mesa? So we uh, were lucky enough to have both two of the programs in California, our health information management bachelor's programs. And what we agreed upon, our advisory board was very strong to say that there needed to be an in-person component uh, to teach the soft skills like I was talking about before. The other uh, program, Shasta College, has a, has a very similar curriculum and they're offered fully online. So in that way, we felt like we could cover you know, still satisfy the community here and then also have the rest of the state or anyone else, who, even if people live in San Diego that wanted fully online could, could use that option. Hasn't really panned out exactly the way we wanted to. I think um, it's gonna be important for, for those of you listening who are developing bachelor's degree programs, really get a sense of what your community needs and what's best for uh, the industry, for the students. And it's very hard to balance because, you know, like my colleagues have mentioned, yes, it's nice for the students to be able to do things fully online, but is it really capturing their complete attention? And are they really developing into the person that your goal, you're trying to develop them into? Um, so that's very hard to do online. There's so much technology and so many great ways to do it, many more than we had even five years ago. Uh, it's just keeping in touch with that and being cognizant of it, ensuring those other skills are still being captured uh, in an online environment. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, like using tech to create access and mm -hmm. making, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all for sharing that. Um, I want, we have a couple minutes left. So I just want to ask real quick, is there any last thing that any of you would like to briefly share that we haven't touched on that's important to you about, you know, the, the community that you serve, the institution that you work in, or the bachelor's programs that you, that you lead or led? I did have one other thing that I wanted to say. I think this is helpful for uh, diversity. Um, I checked our class that, uh, that started this year. This is our second class, and we have 50% uh, minority. So I thought that was definitely a good amount. Yeah, no, that's great. And in nursing, I know like the, the racial diversity is less at the bachelor's level than at the associate level. So increasing the share of bachelor's degrees who are folks of color is really huge. So yeah, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Reed. Um, any other final words from anybody else? Uh, I think it is just really rely on your other support from other faculty. If you're not sure what, if you think you might want a bachelor's degree at your college and you're not even sure what area, you know, definitely do your research, find out from your community what areas there's some really innovative um, bachelor's degree programs because in our state, at least, they can't be duplicated with the UC and CSU systems. So there's programs like innovative or um, interaction design, like the way that we interact with like phones. And um, then there's equine studies because there's an area of California that, that focuses on ranch management. And so really be, be creative and um, open and just try to serve your community as best you can. I think that's what, what we always, what we've all done in our programs. Um, I guess I would just, um, share that communication, establishing very solid communication channels and keeping them open is absolutely vital when you are bringing in an extended degree into a two-year institution. It looks different than with the two-year piece and people have to make transitions and they get a little bit intimidated by that and you have to make sure that you know, if you're the director, you're per the person in charge of that, that you establish those things very concretely in the beginning and that I mean I think most of the time my role is an air traffic controller I'm I'm I know everybody who who's the best fit for whether it's the students whether it's faculty or student affairs support um, I know where to send people and who to get a hold of and how to make sure I always always make it my priority to keep certain channels open all the time and not allow them to be kind of convoluted um, so I think that's really, really important. Um, and that also translates to the community. But when the community comes into your college, they need to be able to feel like they are heard and that you know what you're doing from top to bottom and left, to right. Um, so I think that's uh, really, really important. Thank you all so, so much. Um, we are coming up on three Eastern. We're all four in different time zones. So we're coming up to the hour, um, which is different for each, each one of us. But I appreciate you three so much sharing your stories, being here and telling us more about your programs. And thank you to all of you for joining the webinar. Um, if you have additional questions, um, my email address is very easy to remember. I'm love at newamerica.org. You can send me questions. Um, if we didn't get to cover something, um, be happy to reach out and connect with you. Um, so I wish you a great rest of the day and thank you so much for spending part of your day with us.